Well, right, folks, the Word of God is alive and powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All Scripture is God-breathed, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we're going to take just a moment of time to prepare ourselves for the study of God's word through the technique of rebound and functioning in Operation Cry, 1 John 1 9, Romans 6 6, 6 11, and 6 13. And that is if necessary. So, with your head bowed and eyes closed, you make your own way with the Lord, and I'll close in our prayer time. Make a couple of announcements and move straight into our Bible study. Heads bowed and eyes closed, you make your own way. Father, we thank you again for the privilege of studying your word. Again, uh, as I approach this lesson, I just have to say, awesome, Father, awesome. Tonight, we're going to see what it actually means to live the Christian way of life from this passage of Scripture. Father, we've been learning how, how to live the Christian way of life from other passages. But my, oh my, <clears throat> this passage again hits the nail on the head. It tells us exactly what the Christian way of life is to be. It's not a ritual without a reality. It's not just going through the motions, Father. It's not just another nice Bible study. Father, we're talking about life as it relates to a spiritual battle that began in eternity past. You designed and <clears throat> determined to put mankind into this battle. You determined to create mankind and allow us to be born into the human race with an old sin nature after Adam sinned, and then to regain the spiritual life that Adam had when he was created in the, in the Garden of Eden. You've allowed us to come back to the point where we're actually going to live the Christian way of life and live a life exactly like Christ lived in his humanity. I know that that blows a lot of people's minds, Father, I want to make all kinds of excuses to why this isn't so. But the truth of the matter is, is if you said it one time, that's all that needs to be said. And you've told us several times that the goal of our life is to become exactly like Christ in his humanity. It's got to be a reachable goal or you're a liar. And I know that's not true. So with that in mind, Father, we're going to turn our attention to your word. And... Um, I just pray, Father, that every person that's online with me, no matter what what medium they come, media they come to, to us on, whether it's Facebook, WebEx, YouTube, or whatever, I pray, Father, that they'll comprehend the truth. May the Spirit of God teach them the meaning of it. May we believe it, transfer it to the launching, uh, launching pad of our soul, and just wait for the circumstance to come along in order to apply it. With that in mind, Father, we turn this over to you and the Spirit of God and praise you for the word in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let me make a couple of announcements before we move on into our study, One Day at a Time, Part, part 8. This coming Sunday morning at 10 o'clock in the morning at American Pie Pizza, 9709 Maumel Boulevard, North Little Rock, Arkansas, 72113, we're going to have our Bible Conference Fellowship Luncheon. We were doing this before COVID. We've been away from this for quite some time now, over a year. But we're going to begin to start this again this coming uh, this coming Sunday on the 18th. And if all goes well, we're going to plan on doing this on the first Sunday of every month. Uh, I will tell you the location and the time, but it's going to be the same time. It may be a different location, but we're going to try to stay right where we are because everything we do there is a, we have accommodations. Uh, we've got uh, people who are uh, kind to us, considerate. Uh, they, 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 they do well by serving us at that point in time. So uh, this coming Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, American Pie Pizza on Maumel Boulevard in 
North Little Rock, exit from Mom, the Maumelle Boulevard, just short of coming into Maumelle. Then the second thing I want to announce is that this coming Wednesday night, this is Wednesday night, one week from tonight, we're going to resume our home Bible study, but it will be on Wednesday night. Same time, same station, 21 St. Thomas Drive, Maumelle, Arkansas, 72113. It'll be here at our residence, and we'll be starting at 7 o'clock, but that's on Wednesday night instead of Monday. We're not going to do, continue the Monday night, but we're going to do the home Bible study on Wednesday, one week from tonight. If you're local, you're more than welcome to come. Then again, on May the 2nd, that's the first Sunday of next month, we'll be meeting at American Pie Pizza at 10 o'clock in the morning for our second Bible Conference Fellowship Luncheon uh, after COVID. Now, with that in mind, if you have any questions, just text me, email me, call me, whatever. Let's move on to our Bible study. This is another great Bible study. Okay, I'm gonna go right here. <clears throat> We've been, we've been speaking about one day at a time, one day at a time. And I indicated at the original uh, lesson eight times ago that there are nine major points in this concept of one day at a time. I call it O-D-A-A-T -O in an abbreviation. But there are nine major points. Point number one and two and three we've already studied. But point number one says time is a logical grace provision, a logi sorry, logistical grace. It's a logistical grace provision for the believer. Now, what is that? Logistical grace is a provision of God for you and me as warriors, as soldiers in the angelic conflict. You don't send our military, that's in a real warfare, you don't send our military out to the front lines of battle with one clip of ammunition. You send them out with enough supplies to fight the battle, but if it takes too long and they're going to run out of supplies, then logistically from back here in the background, we bring more supplies up to the front lines. Listen, God never runs out of logistical grace. He never runs out of supplies. So no matter how bad the battle is in your life, the war between the flesh and the spirit, no matter how bad that is, God never runs out of supplies. You can't use them up. But what we need to realize is that time is one of those provisions from God as we enter into this battle called the angelic conflict. So time is a logistical grace provision. Well, let's define time for a moment. We're going to talk about, we're not talking about 8 o'clock, 8.20, 6 o'clock in the morning, midnight. No, that's not what we're talking about. When we talk about time being a logistical grace provision, let's define it. Time is this. Time is that indefinite continued progress of existence. Uh, let's see. Uh, this had a beginning point. You and I had a beginning point. We were born. And each hour of the day, each day of the week, each month, each year is a an indefinite continued progress of existence. How long are you going to live? Well, look at it again. Time is the indefinite. See, we don't know how long we're gonna be here. We don't know how much time God has given us. We're gonna talk about that later. But time is the indefinite continued progress. So you're still living. You were born back there, you're still living. In the past, the present and the future. So time is this indefinite continued progress that started way back there is continuing today and it'll continue under the future for a particular amount of time. So that's what that's what time is, this indefinite continued progress of existence and events in the past, present, and future regarded as the whole, going back to the back to the beginning, all the way up here to the end. Point two, in the days provided, that's one day at a time for you and me, in the days provided logistically by logistical grace, only the days that you are in fellowship with God, that's green circle living, have any significance in the execution of God's plan, purpose, and will for your life. So you're not here on planet Earth just to fiddle away. You and I are on planet Earth 
to be a participant in the resolution of the angelic conflict. So God gives us one day at a time. Now, in God's mind, he already knows the number of days you're going to, you're going to exist. He knows the number of days from the time you're saved to the time you die. But in those days that are provided by logistical grace, every day, one day at a time, is God's provision for you to participate in the angelic conflict. Now, understand this. One day, you and I and we are going to meet Jesus at the Bema seat if you're saved. And there will be a consideration of all of the good works that you've done to determine whether they are human good or divine good so that you can and will be rewarded at that time dependent upon whether you have produced divine good rather than human good. Now, if someone came to me that's brand new, they say, hey, what's this human good stuff? What's this divine good stuff? These are terms to define and describe certain parts of God's plan for your life. This is one of the reasons why, as we get down into our Bible study tonight, we're going to see the importance of Bible doctrine in your life. So in the days provided one day at a time, by logistical grace, only the days that you are in fellowship, see, that's why we use 1 John 1, 9 and Romans 6, 6, 6, 11, 6, 13 to get back in fellowship with God if, in fact, we get out of fellowship. And only those days have any significance. See, God has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for your life. He has a will for your life. But the truth of the matter is, is that that plan, that will, that purpose for your life is meaningless until you learn to live in the green circle, which means living in the sphere of the spirit. Bob Thiem called that the divine dinosphere. I, I used that term for a long time. But there were some things about that divine dinosphere that I felt I could, I could teach in a better way. Not that there was anything wrong with that, but I could teach it in a better way from my standpoint. And so I, I, I call this the sphere of the spirit. That's Ephesians, that, that's Ephesians 5.18. So if you're not living in that sphere, if you're not living in the sphere of the spirit, Whatever your whatever value is on your life at that time regarding God's plan, His purpose, His will for your life is valueless, and all that's coming out of the beam of seed of Christ. Point number three: days are lost through divine discipline administered to the believer. And I had a diagram where I had I think I had ten days: D one, D two, D three, D four, all the way up to D ten, and in that in that series of D numbers. I grayed out some of them to indicate during that period of time you were out of fellowship with God. God was divinely disciplining you with either warning discipline, intensive discipline, or dying discipline. And I was talking with someone uh, after class uh, last uh, last week, and the idea uh, I used to teach the concept of sim with. I could still teach it. S sim s i m self induced misery. Warning discipline, intensified discipline, and and uh, sin and death. But se uh, uh, self-induced misery needs to be set apart from divine discipline. That understanding of self-induced misery should be taught and is taught under the law of volitional responsibility. So if you're talking about the law of volitional responsibility, you've got, you've got volition. You're either going to be positive or you're going to be negative. If you're negative, you end up with self-induced misery. But if you stay out of fellowship with God, God begins to divinely discipline you. There's where the warning discipline comes in. There's where the intensive discipline. And then ultimately, there's the sin and the death. So days, through, days are lost. And those grayed out days in D1 through D10 indicated that during that period of time, you were out of fellowship with God, God was divinely disciplining you, and that part of that day, as far as God's plan, purpose, or will for your life, it's valueless again, because you're living your life outside of fellowship, outside of fellowship with God. You can't produce the Christian way of life until you're living inside the sphere of the Spirit. And over a period of time, as I've grown in my own understanding, as I understand that I've grown, I've come to understand now, and I will teach this again sometime in the near future, but I've come to understand that Bob Thiem was right 
when he talked about the moment of salvation. At the moment of salvation, you are actually in the sphere of the spirit. However, because you have little doctrine, no doctrine, it's, it's not long, maybe seconds, <laughs> seconds before you commit your first sin, you're out of fellowship with God. You never realize that you're in fellowship with God. But God places you there for a particular reason. But the moment you sin, you're out of fellowship and you stay out of fellowship with God until you learn Operation Recovery, Rebound and Operation Cry. So days are lost through divine discipline administered to the believer. You've lost that day. It's meaningless in terms of his will, his purpose, and plan for your life. Now let's pick up right here tonight with point number four of the nine points of one day at a time. And that is the importance of Bible doctrine. Why? For length of days. Now, what that's implying is that as a born-again Christian, as you come to Bible class, you grow in Christ. And as you're growing in Christ, you're executing his plan and will for your life. You're accruing, you're accruing uh, blessing in time and reward in eternity that will be distributed at the time of the Bema Seat. But how do you get there? How do you get all this? It's because of Bible doctrine, the importance of Bible doctrine for length of days. I've got a diagram coming up about that. But just think about that. How long are you going to live as a born-again Christian? From the time you're saved or the time you die or the day, time, time of the rapture occurs, what, how long of a time span is that? Now, let's just assume for a moment you're not going to live long enough to be raptured. That means you're born again at a certain time. You're going to die out here at a certain time. But between the time you're born again and the time you die, how important is Bible doctrine? Believe it or not, it has something to do with how long you're going to live. Oh my, isn't that amazing? Let's take a look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1. See, now I've got some passages of scripture here, and all of these passages of scripture are related to the point that we're trying to make. We don't just we just don't throw these statements out. Oh, yeah, the importance of Bible doctrine for length of days. I wonder what that means. Well, the truth of the matter, what it's indicating is from the time you're saved to the time you die, God already knows that. You don't know it, but we're going to, we're going to talk about that also. But if you want to live longer, if you want to live a longer life, it has everything to do with how much Bible doctrine you have risen in your soul and how you are applying it. Now we're going to reach back to uh, an Old Testament passage. You said, I thought we weren't supposed to live out of the Old Testament. Didn't say that. I say we don't get our rules for living out of the Old Testament. We don't get our rules for living out of the Gospels. We don't get our rules for living anywhere in Acts chapter 1 through, uh, through chapter 9. Only when we get to the Apostle Paul does he have the mystery doctrine of the age of grace. That's where we learn how to live the Christian way of life, the rules for living. But there are principles out of the Old Testament that both Jesus, of course, he was in the age of Israel. But let's pick up Paul, that Paul would go back to the Old Testament and draw upon a passage of Scripture, a circumstance there, and teach us a principle that we call a universal principle. A universal principle is true in any dispensation of time, any age. So we're going to go back to the Old Testament, and we're going to pick up some information here that will give us some indication as to the importance of Bible doctrine for the length of life after you are saved. Isn't that amazing? Proverbs 3.1 says, My son, this is David speaking to his son Solomon. He said, my son, do not forget my teaching, but have your heart comply with my commandments. For length of days, uh oh, for length of days and years of life and peace, they will add to you. Isn't that amazing? How many times have people read the Bible, read that passage of scripture? Oh, that's a wonderful passage. David's talking to his son, Solomon. He says, oh, don't forget my teaching, Solomon. 
Yeah, you have. And, and by the way, have your heart comply with my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. And then we go on to verse, we go on to verse three and say, what did he say back there? Well, I don't really know. I forget what he said back there. No, listen to this. My son, he said, do not forget my teaching. Well, that implies that David's teaching him something. He said, to have your heart comply with these commandments for, my, for length of days and years of life and peace, they will add to you. Let's take a look at this. First of all, the phrase, my son. See, I've got those super grace, uh, super superscript numbers there indicating we're going to talk about that and expand our understanding down below. So he says, my son, that is in fact David teaching his son Solomon. Here's what he told me. He said, do not forget my teaching. Now, here's a contemporary application. What does that mean? Well, I have a son. Maybe you have sons. Maybe you have, uh, maybe you have daughters. We're going to talk about that. But David is talking to David's talking to Solomon, and he said, "Do not forget my my teaching." And this it oh by the way, this is a command. Isn't it amazing? This is a dad commanding his son to listen to what I'm telling you, and 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 don't forget it. So the contemporary application: this is a command to every Christian father. That's me. That's you. If you're a father, that's you. A command to you as a Christian father to teach your children, male and female. David is actually talking to Solomon here. But why in the world would you just talk to uh, teach your son and let your let your your daughters run wild? That's not the idea. It just so happens that David was talking to Solomon at the time this was written. It was written about that circumstance. So the contemporary application is this is a command to every Christian father to teach doctrine. Teach what? Teach doctrine. D-O-C-T-R-I-N-E. And that word right there, that word doctrine, is something that many Christians, when they hear the word, they just turn their nose up. They want to talk. They want to run away. Listen, in 1975, when I organized the Bible Doctrine Church of Little Rock, we didn't advertise anywhere except on the corner of the street on Wilson Road so that people coming out there would be able to find it because it was sort of like on a side street. And when I put up that sign, Bible Doctrine Church of Little Rock, I had pastors, I had other Christians say to me, why in the world did you put that word doctrine on there? Well, what was the issue? They say, if you put that word doctrine on that sign, that you're going to be associated with R.B. Thien Jr. I said, well, what's the matter with that? We're teaching Bible doctrine. We're teaching the word of God. So here's the issue. I just want you to understand that word doctrine is, is not well respected by many Christians. But here's the issue. This is a command to me, to you as a father, to teach doctrine to your children, male and female. And here's the principle. For doctrine to be usable, it must be, remember, it must be remembered, and it can't be remembered if it isn't taught. So when you look back at your life and you ask yourself, how did I do? How did I do? I'm not going to measure my own, my own uh, fathership in terms of how I did along this line. I know I was a pastor. I know I was speaking, uh, teaching, uh, speaking the truth. I was trying to live it. But much of the time I was gone somewhere. Gone here, gone there, in school, uh, it, at work. It was an amazing time. There were, uh, as I look back my own life, I have to say there's certain areas here where I failed myself. I didn't know any better. But for fathers growing up today, let me tell you what, this is, this is a, a, a command to Christian fathers, universal, universal principle, to teach doctrine to his children, male and female. You see, God's plan, God's plan in point three, God's plan calls for every believer, whoop, ho, every believer, see, pass, uh, father, you're teaching your children, male, female, it makes no difference. So whoever you are out here, as a child, as a sibling, 
God's plan calls for every believer, regardless of your age, to learn Bible doctrine and apply it to his or her own experience. See, this is not just a matter of going to Bible class. Oh, great Bible class. Well, when are we going to start to apply? I'm not, not implying anything about you here. The issue is out here. Do we understand that we go to Bible class to learn the Word of God? And tragically, people are going to Bible classes. They're, they're, going to, they're going to assemble in what we call the church. The pastor steps in the pulpit. And I saw somebody post something on Facebook within the last 24 hours and said, when are the pastors going to start teaching the Word of God to the people in the pew? And that post went on to say, and rightfully so, I've indicated this many, many times over the years. Pastors are not teaching the word of God because they want to protect their job. They don't want to have to move. They don't want to be, they don't want to be kicked out. So what do they do? They become milk toasts. When are we going to learn to trust God for our finances? When are we going to learn to trust God for our circumstances of life? When are we going to learn to trust, trust God for the for the, the plan, the purpose, the will for our life? And be willing to take a stand. You turn on the TV today, and one of the words that you hear, you you look at your you look at your emails, you look at your messages, and people are being told, stand, 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 stand. What that means is we need to get off our backside and start doing what we need to do if we're going to be able to be free to teach the Word of God, to send out missionaries, to evangelize the lost, and, and you understand? So God's plan calls for every believer to learn Bible doctrine and then apply it to his or her own experience. And here's a principle, principles, promises, doctrines, techniques. Here's a principle. Every believer should be spiritually self-sustaining. Well, when the little baby is born, it sucks from the breast. It has a, it, it has a bottle and it, with a nipple on it and, and feeds it that way. Eventually, it comes to learn to pick stuff off, off the tray with their fingers and stick it in their mouth and chew it and swallow it. Then they learn to use a fork, a spoon, put food in their mouth and eat every day you learn you you don't want to be 35 years old unless you are infirm and have your mother dad or somebody feeding you so as you grow physically you learn to do these things yourself and the same thing is the same principle is true in the spiritual life there needs to come a time when you understand the word of god and you're living, you're living the Christian way of life you're on your own rather than leaning on someone taking you through life spiritually. So every believer should become spiritually self-sustaining. Self -sustaining. That means a wife, a, a, a husband, a children, an aunt, an uncle, a grandma, the preacher, the deacons, whatever. If you're a born-again Christian, you live your own life. You are responsible for your own Christian life. Then in that same verse, my, don, my son, do not forget my teaching. He said, but let your heart comply with my commandments. What does that mean? Let your heart comply with my commandments. He said, well, let me see. Where's the heart? And I said, well, it's I remember right here in your chest. No, we know, you know, that's not where the heart is. This is the spiritual heart. And it's in the right lobe of the mentality up here in your head. So he said, but have your heart comply with my commandments. And that word comply with means to guard. So remember, the heart refers to the thinking part of the mind. We're not talking about the brain now. We're talking about the mentality of the soul. So when you look back at, at yourself and realize that as a born again Christian, you are a trichotomous being. You have a physical body. You have a human spirit. At the moment you were saved, you, you, the Holy Spirit regenerated your human spirit. And you have a soul, which is the real you. You take the body away, you take the, you take the spirit away, you still have a soul that is the real you. And the real you, the, your soul, is comprised of five different things. 
self-consciousness, which means you are aware of yourself. You know that you exist. See, that's self-consciousness. There is volition with a positive and negative pole. You have the capacity to do the right thing. You have the capacity to do the wrong thing. That's part of the angelic conflict. But you also have, as a part of your soul, you also have mentality. This is where you think. This is where you store information. This is where a frame of reference is to be able to recall information, to be able to apply it to the, to the situations of life. So the soul comprises of self-consciousness, volition, mentality, emotion, and a conscience. But at point one, remember the heart refers to the thinking part of the mind that is the soul's mentality, and that's the emboldened part of the soul. One of the five parts of the soul is your mentality. And this refers to the thinking part. So what does David say up here? He said, but have your heart comply with my commandments. See, this is where the information that David is teaching Solomon, this is when Solomon says, ah, oh, I got that, Dad. I got that. Yes, I understand that. Well, when, when Solomon believes that, it goes it goes into the soul, into the mentality of soul, and it's stored there. So remember, but your but have your heart comply with my commandments. This is a father speaking to his son. Secondly, David was very listen, David was very anxious for his son Solomon. See, when you when you read the when you read the history of this, when you read about David's life. You're going to realize that when David says to Solomon, excuse me, Solomon, listen, I want you to hear my commandments. I want you to guard them. Don't let them go. Keep them, apply them. Why was David so anxious about this? Is because when he raised his son, when he raised, raised his son Absalom, he failed. You see, David was very anxious for his son Solomon to learn doctrine, and Bible doctrine is truth. Truth is Bible doctrine, so he's wanting David, to, he's wanting Solomon to learn the biblical truth. But the question is, why in the world did David, was he so anxious for Solomon to learn doctrine? And the answer is this. It was because when you look at the history of David's life, David in raising his son Absalom failed. He failed as a father. So when you see son number one, when you see this son fail out here, you have this other son coming along and say, geez, I don't want him to fail like this one did. Because I failed my son, he failed. I don't want that to happen to my other, my other sons. So David was very anxious when he was talking to Solomon when he made this statement up here, when he said, uh, Solomon, don't forget my teaching. To have your heart comply with my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Remember, we're talking about point number three, four here, which is the importance of Bible doctrine for length of days. So David was trying to encourage Sol uh, uh, Solomon. And what's he going to do? He's going to exhort him. He's going to encourage Solomon. And how's he going to encourage him? He said, Solomon, look. He said, I'm giving you some information. I'm giving you truth. I'm giving you the word of God. He said, I want you to guard that. I want you to protect that. So David's encouragement was an exhortation of Solomon to do what? To guard, to keep them. Don't let them get away. Guard his commandments. Now watch this. Guard his commandments. David said, guard my commandments. That's David, a man. This is not God. This is David talking to his son. God spoke to David. David's talking to Solomon. He blew it, though, when he was dealing with Absalom. He said, I don't want this to happen again. So David exhorts Solomon to guard his commandments. That's David's commandments, not the Ten Commandments, but David's commandments that he is giving to Solomon at this point in time. Well, if he wants Solomon to guard his commandments. What does that mean? What does guarding David's commandments mean? Well, the answer is simple. Guarding David's commandments means that Solomon needs to have his father's commandments ready for application when the time arrives to actually apply those commandments to the circumstance of life. See, that's what guarding is. Oh, yes, I heard that last week, Dad. Two weeks later, David says, uh, excuse me, Solomon, I saw what you did that. Uh, oh, you're right, Dad, I forgot about that. See, you didn't guard it. You didn't guard it, Solomon. 
David is giving David is giving Solomon commandments. He's giving giving him principles from the Word of God, trying to teach him the plan of God for his life. And Solomon says, oh, "Dad, I, I listen. I, I listen. You don't understand, man. I've got I, I'm I've got a date tonight. I, I'm I'm too busy. Uh, tell me that later." Well, you can't guard something you reject. This is why we're talking about the importance of Bible doctrine to our lives. Every one of us are required to live the truth out of our lives. Why? Because we're, we are ambassadors for Christ and the angelic complex. So guarding David's commandments means that Solomon needs to have his father's commandments ready. You have to listen, Solomon. You have to believe it. You transfer this down onto the launching pad. You wait for the circumstance to come along, and wham, there it is, and you make an application. You have guarded your daddy's commandments. Then he goes on to say, for length of days. Okay, so here are the commandments. You need to guard them. You need to keep these things. Why do you need to do it? For length of days, he says. Here's the contemporary application. Length of days, this refers to a long life in phase two of the Christian way of life. See, universal application. He's, David's talking to Solomon. But this is true in any, in any dispensation. It's true in any age. The idea is this. As you're taking in the word of God, you're, you're, you're uh, obeying the word of God. You're applying the word of God. David says, look, when you do this, God extends the days of your life. Remember, one day at a time, you lose time, you lose a day, you lose, you lose the significance of the day in the angelic conflict when you fail to apply, you reject the truth. So the contemporary application of for length of days, this is for every born again Christian no matter who you are. This refers to a long life and phase two of the Christian way of life. Now, someone might say, I don't want to live a long life. I'm sick of this place. I'm sick of this life. I can't stand it anymore. I want out of here. Do you realize, you realize you're, you're battling against God when you say that? Do you realize that this is not God's plan? It's not his purpose. It's not his will for you to leave one day before he says you're out of here. So that being, that being the case, we ought to be overjoyed about life no matter what our circumstance. This is, a part of, this is a part of the circumstances of your life or a part of God's plan for your life. You may have caused some of that. Well, I didn't want this pressure. I didn't want this suffering. I didn't want, well, excuse me. Positive, positive or negative volition. What put, you, what put us there? So we can be miserable the rest of our life. We can be happy. We can rejoice. We can give thanks no matter what the circumstance of life. So the contemporary application for length of days is this refers to a long life in phase two of the Christian way of life. I've got two little diagrams here. One is a short life. It's just a very short line on the screen. Now the extended life line is a long life. So you have a long life. You have a short life. It's your choice. Remember the angelic conflict? Remember, we are citizens. Our citizenship is not just the United States. That's a temporal. That's a civic issue. I indicated last time we were together, I, I think it was last time, that I'm, a, I'm a, a citizen of the state of Arkansas, and I'm a citizen of the United States of America. You are a citizen of your state. You're a citizen of the United States of America, if in fact you are, if you are an American citizen. Your citizenship is in the United States and the state where you live. You have dual citizenship. But here's the issue. This refers to a long life, and we need to realize that while we have a, we have a civic citizenship state and, and uh, in the United States, a spiritual citizenship is in heaven. And God says, look, your citizenship is up here. I've put you in a, in a foreign land. The foreign land is the, is the world. And we were born into this foreign land with a, with a citizenship up there in heaven, in the third heaven. God's got us down here, and we are down here as ambassadors for Christ. 
And in ambassadors, you have length of days. You've got a certain number of days you're going to live. And God already has those measured. Determined on how you live your Christian way of life determines the length of your life. Now, there's some exceptions to that, and we'll get to that. But the point is, David is saying here, if you want to live a longer life, then you need to remember what I'm teaching you. And if you don't remember what, the, what your father taught you, or maybe your father didn't teach you, you need to remember what the pastor is teaching you, because every Christian is responsible to live the Christian way of life. And you determine the length of your life based upon how you live your Christian way of life. Well, what is David telling Solomon with this phrase, length of days? What is David telling Solomon? Well, the answer is simple again. David is telling Solomon that Solomon will have a long life in the sense of a long life in phase two. See, he said, okay, yes, uh, Solomon, okay, now you're a born-again you're a born again believer. In this case, Solomon would be, would be a Messianic Jew. He would believe that Jesus Christ is, in fact, the Messiah. If Paul were around that point in time and David was there and Solomon was there and they found, Paul found out they were Messianic Jews, Paul would probably try to persecute them, kill them, whatever. That was Paul's life. But David is telling Solomon, son, if you want to live a long life, see, the, the issue is not just how long you're going to live. The issue is your productivity during that period of time. Years of life. What does that mean? That's the second phrase. He said for length of days and years of life. Well, the length of days is how long you're going to live. But the years of life means a full life. Years of life means a full life, length of days, a long life, and a full life. See, God wants just not to live a long life. He wants us to have a long life and a full life. How about a long life that's just horrible the whole way through? No, we don't want that. God says, look, I'm going to lengthen your days. I'm going to, if you're living the word of God, you're doing what I want you to do. You know my will. You know my purpose. You know my plan. Here it is. You're doing it. I'm going to give you more days to get the job done here, Solomon. I'm going to give you more days, Jim, to get this thing done. I'm not only going to give you long days, length of days. He said, I'm going to give you years of life. I'm going to give you a full life. Not long in the sense of length of days. The full life doesn't mean, oh, yeah, the length of days, years of, years of life. Yeah, that's, no, these are not synonymous. He's going to give you length of life, and that length of life is going to be full of life. What does a full of life mean? If he's going to make your life full of life, what is it? Well, the answer is simple again. A full life means an abundant life, a life which is characterized by a maximum amount of time experiencing inner happiness. So what that means is God's going to extend your life, and you will be happy the whole time. See, that's because you're doing the will of God for your life. When you're out of fellowship with God, you're not, you're not doing the will. God brings divine discipline into the life to get your attention. You're out of fellowship to draw you back in. And what God wants us to have is a, a Christian life that is doing exactly what God wants us, wants us to do. Live, live your Christian life obeying, obeying the commandments of God. And he said, look, I'll extend your life. And it will be a happy life, inner happiness, not happiness in sin for a season, pleasure in sin for a season, not happiness because you're, you've got the establishment principles, your freedom, marriage, family, nationalism, employment. Oh, those are all going so well. I'm just so happy. Take any one of those away. You're no longer happy. See, pleasure in sin for a season and Establishment happiness is transient. It can be here today, gone tomorrow. But inner happiness, plus H, is it's permanent as long as you're doing the will of God for your life. So here's the question again. What produces a full life? Okay, God wants to give us length of years. He wants to give us a full life based on the doctrine that you have in your soul and the application of that doctrine to the circumstances of life as a citizen of heaven functioning as an ambassador of Christ on planet Earth. 
So you go, what this full life? What produces a full life? It's a life of inner happiness. See, when you understand you've got a circumstance out here, everything is falling apart, but God says, rejoice. He said, give thanks in all things. We're going to see that God is going to support us in every way so that we can walk in stability through any circumstance of life. Isn't that amazing? Father, what an amazing God you are. What an amazing God. But the truth is, many people don't understand that because they're not doing what you ask them to do. David told dear Solomon, look, Solomon, here it is. I'm, gonna, I'm giving you these truths. I want you to hear my commandments. I want you to guard these commandments. And he said, man, when you do that, he said, you'll not only have length of days, he said, you're going to have a full life. A life of inner happiness, no matter what the circumstance. So what produces a full life? A life of inner happiness? Here it is. Here's what produces that. What produces the full life? What produces the inner happiness? Here's the answer. Pertinent doctrine applied produces inner happiness. So when you take the word of God that's stored in your soul and you're applying to the circumstances of life, you are able to have happiness no matter what the circumstance of life. Just a moment, let me change the tape, please. Just one moment, please. Okay, I'm going to move on. Sorry. The tape was stuck. Okay, let's come back here again. The question was, what does a full life mean? We said a full life means an abundant life is characterized by a maximum amount of time experiencing inner happiness. And what produces full, a full life? What produces a life of inner happiness? Here it is. I indicated earlier, pertinent doctrine. So remember what I'm telling you, Solomon. That means I'm going to give you the truth. You have to, you have to, to believe it, store it, and when the time comes, you need to apply it. And when you do this, Solomon, every circumstance of life, you are going to be at, you're going to be happy. And guess what? You will be at peace. What does that mean? Not only, not only you're going to have year, year, a long life, length of days, years of life. Also, you're going to have peace. And what does the word peace mean? Here, the word peace refers to inner happiness, producing stability of mentality. Stop right there. Let's make sure that that's, that's more than just a statement made. You're going to have a long life. It's going to be a full life. And you're going to have peace. Well, let's see, what is peace then? Peace, again, refers to inner happiness. Oh, more than that now. It's the inner happiness that you have producing stability of mentality. What does that mean? That means that when you find yourself in a, in a bad circumstance, in a circumstance where things are not going right, pressure, be, and by the way, the pressure is because you're doing something right, not because you're doing something wrong. That's discipline. But the, the pressure in your life because you're doing something right, this would be the suffering suffering by association. It would be um, suffering because, uh, because you're, you're doing something right and somebody is trying to afflict you, persecute you. But you have peace. You have, you have inner happiness that produces stability of mind. And what does that mean, stability of mind? That means you're not up down up down up 
you're angry, you're bitter, you're 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 okay, then you go back down in the dumper again. So it's just up and down, up and down. Up. That's not stability. Stability of mentality means you're you're you are at peace with yourself. You're at peace with God. You're at peace with a circumstance. You don't like the circumstance, but this is life. And I've indicated to you, we're not going to press on with this tonight. But it's going to get worse. Are you hearing me? Please hear me. It is going to get worse. He said, I know that'll be in the tribulation. No, I'm talking about in your lifetime. It is going to get worse. The problem is, is the, the tsunami, the tsunami of pain, wrongdoing hasn't quite reached us yet, but it is on its way. And it's going to it's going to affect us in many kinds of ways. It's going to affect us medically, financially, food, rest, work. These things are going to be tossed up in the air like you can't believe. It's coming. So the question is, what will you do during that period of time? Well, I would say, okay, <laughs> you need to listen to your pastor. You need to go all the way back up to David talking to Solomon, saying, Solomon, I want you to I want you to hear my commandments. I want you to guard these things. Because even, even by doing that, when all this falls apart in your life, Solomon, falls apart in Israel falls apart in the world. You as a believer, you will be able to maintain a stability of mentality. You can think right. You won't be frustrated. You won't be angry. You won't be disappointed. You won't be bitter. You won't be arrogant. But you'll be stable in your mind. You'll be able to think. You'll be able to, you'll be able to witness. You'll be able to be a, 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 a warrior for God on the front lines of battle. So he said, in peace, stability of mind. That's inner happiness that produces stability of mind. Based on doctrine that was taught by a pastor teacher, perhaps given to you by your father. See, this is the same concept as Isaiah 20, 26, 3. You're going to, in other words, you'll have peace. You'll have, you'll have mental stability. Isaiah 26, 3 says, you, Lord, give perfect peace. What in the world? You, Lord, you give perfect peace. Oh, please listen to me, please. I'm finding people out on Facebook asking people to pray, to pray, to pray, pray for this, pray for that. There's nothing wrong with that. But how do you pray for an unspoken request? How do you pray for an unspoken request? And it is amazing that people are asking other people to pray who don't have a clue about what it means to be in fellowship with God, and their prayers aren't being heard anyway. But for those of us who are doing the right thing in the right way, Isaiah said, you, Lord, you give perfect peace. David is talking to Solomon, and he said, if you will listen to my commandments, and you will, you will keep these commandments, you will do these things, you will have a long life, you will have a full life, you will have peace, you will have, you'll be mentally stable in all of this, and that's what God wants us to have. So Isaiah says, you, Lord, you give perfect peace. That's inner happiness producing stability of mind. See, David and Isaiah understood exactly the same thing. I understand this. I'm practicing this. I'm learning to practice it in a greater way. If I fail somewhere, I say, Lord, that was wrong. Lord, I, I, I realize it was wrong. I'm going to pick up and move on this next time. I want stability of mind. I want you to have stability of mind. But stability in mind doesn't come from the circumstances being good. This is stability of mind in, a, in circumstances that are going haywire. It's like a, in a spiritual tsunami, a spiritual tornado, a spiritual hurricane. 
Everything around you is falling apart, but there you are. The wind couldn't blow you down. You, Lord, give perfect peace. That's inner happiness, producing stability of mind. And here's what he, he said. You, Lord, give perfect peace. Oh, my, to whom does he do this? To those who keep their purpose. Stop right there. Please stop. Did you hear that? Do you want perfect peace? Do you want mental stability? It won't be from complaining, marabouring, griping. It will be understanding the circumstances and knowing that, God, you are in control of all this down here. You're allowing this to happen. And what a fantastic opportunity is for me and you and we here to be a witness for you because we have mental stability in the midst of all of this disruption. This isn't just foolishness. No, it's not. This is God's word. So what did he say? I my the Isaiah passage here. Let me pick it up here again. Right here in point number two. He said, You Lord give perfect peace to those who keep their purpose. What is your purpose? Your purpose is to fulfill God's plan. He has a purpose for your life, He has a will for your life. The storm is coming, but you can be firm. And put your trust in him. Isn't it amazing? You, Lord, give perfect peace to those who keep their purpose. See, you have to keep your purpose, but keep it what? Oh, not just keep it a little bit. He said, keep it firm. There it is right there. Firm. This isn't firm. The wind's blowing. The circumstances of life going. There you go. Whoop it. Wherever. No. Circumstance of life. There you are. The, it can't it can't move you it can't move you why because we're trusting god and trusting his word so he goes on to say then david talking to solomon he said you're going to have peace mental stability he said these two things let's go back here for just a moment he said the the uh, length of days right here for length of days and years of life right there and years of life he said, in peace, those three things, he said, they will add to you. Wait a minute. God's going to add something to your life. Question, who or what is they? They will add to you. See, these things will add to you. So you have to ask yourself, if God's going to add something to us, what is he going to add? They will add. We're going to find out. We're going to find out what causes the addition, and then we'll find out what he's going to add. And here it is. He said, they will add to you. Who or what is they? The answer is this. They refers to the principles of doctrine. Principles of doctrine, those doctrines, those, those uh, truths that you're assimilating, you're metabolizing, they are going to add to you. What are they going to add? See, all of these things, length of days and years of life and peace, will be added to your life because of Bible doctrine resident in the soul, in your soul, applied to the appropriate moment. Now, let me stop right there. Too fast. All of these things, what is it? Length of days, years of life, and peace. Would you like to have all that? Length of days, years of life, that's a full life, and peace, inner happiness. They will be added to you and added to your life because Bible doctrine risen in your soul is applied to the real moment, appropriate moment. So here's the issue. When you take in the word of God, you hold on to the word of God, you guard it, you apply it to the circumstance of life and apply it to the appropriate circumstance. Guess what? These things will be added to you. More days. Days that are that are that are enabling you to be happy and a stable mentality. How could you want any more than that? Point number five. This is the fifth of the nine points. He said, where the, this is where there is spiritual momentum. What does that mean? Spiritual momentum means you're moving forward, okay? Not backward, you're moving forward. 
where where there is spiritual momentum in your life and spiritual growth, two things, spiritual momentum and spiritual growth. Spir spiritual momentum means you are advancing. Spiritual growth means you're, you're going from babyhood to adolescence to spiritual self-esteem, spiritual autonomy, maximum spiritual maturity. So where there is momentum, you're moving forward, and spiritual growth, you're moving from babyhood up to maximum spiritual maturity. How are you doing it? Through metabolization of doctrine that includes application. See, sometimes when we talk about metabolizing doctrine, I think the mind has a, the mind, uh, it's, it stops performing when you get the doctrine down, down to your, uh, down on the launching pad. But that's not where it's supposed to stop. Metabolization doesn't stop when you get the doctrine on your uh, on your launching pad. Metabolization is not complete until it's applied to the circumstance of life. There is no spiritual growth. There is no momentum in the Christian way of life until you learn to apply what you're what you're getting, applying the truth. So whether it's spiritual momentum, meaning moving forward, and spiritual growth, moving to maximum spiritual maturity. And how are you going to get there? Through metabolization of doctrine. You're coming to Bible class, coming to Bible class, coming to Bible class, coming to Bible class, and applying when the circumstances arise. Then days are meaningful. Watch this now. Days are meaningful and accompanied by prosperity. This is just another thing about one day at a time. By moving forward, by, by moving toward the finish line, and by growing spiritually through the, through the intake of the Word of God and the application of that, guess what? Days are meaningful. That means this is not a wasted day. This is a great day. And not only are they meaningful, but they're accompanied with prosperity. It's not just, I hit the jackpot. It's not just financial. But this includes spiritual prosperity. So your days are going to be meaningful and accompanied with prosperity when you are advancing and you're growing spiritually toward maturity. Back to the psalm, Psalm 90, 12. Here's what it says. So, David, so teach us to number our days. Wait a minute now. I thought I didn't know how many days I had. Well, let's see, I've been saved since February 1962. I'm going to see, there's 27 or 28 days in February. Then in March and April and May, I could add up all those days. I could know how many days I've been saved. So he said, teach us to number our days. Why? That we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Ooh, hold it now. Get this now. Teach us to number our days. Why? That we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Hey, the heart is right here. The question is, do you have anything there? Is there anything stored up here? Because when you look out here and you see what you're doing, are you wise or are you unwise? Are you wise or are you foolish? Well, Dave, here's what, here's what he says. So teach us to number our days. What does that phrase mean? See, this actually is a prayer of Moses. It's a prayer of Moses. He said, wait a minute, this is Psalms. I said, this is a, it's a prayer of Moses. Referring back. Teach us to number our days. Moses' prayer is that God would instruct us, and here's a contemporary application. Here's what, here's what we're learning from this. Teach me to number my days, Lord. Why did why am I doing that? To estimate. See, that doesn't mean, oh, perfect. No, you estimate the number of days of your life correctly. I am going to live a long life. Oh, I don't think I'm going to live very long. No, you see, he says, teach us to number our days. And the reason we're numbering our days is to estimate the number of days of our life correctly, to estimate the rapidity with which our days pass away. Good grief. I would, uh, hardly, there's hardly a time when we go out. We're fellowshipping. And somebody's talking about something that happened. 
or is going to happen or has happened in the past. And they say, I can't believe it. Somebody told me today, I can't believe that we're in, we're in the middle of April already. January 1st was only two weeks ago. No, it was more than that, but it just seems like it was two weeks ago. You look back right now, and when I look back now and take a look at my, young, my younger life, it seems like it just happened yesterday. So we're being told here to number our days in order to be able to estimate the number of our days correctly, to estimate the rapidity with which our days pass away. Goodness gracious, you look up, woo, they're all gone. To estimate the liability of our days the liability that our days may be shortened. See, in other words, number your days. This point C here, to estimate the liability of our, that our days may be shortened. When what happens is the liability, that means my days are liable to be, liable to be shortened when I take a look at my life and see how I'm living. To estimate the liability of our days, that they may be shortened. To estimate the certainty that our days must soon come to an end. Yeah, they're going to come to an end. Yeah, they are. To estimate our days as bearing on our future state of being. So when you when we when we meet Jesus face to face, you'll be in your resurrection body. You may have some rewards, rewards. You may not have some rewards. You may have a lot of rewards. You may have a few. You may not have any. So what are we doing? We're going to take a look at our life back here, he says. Teach us to number our days. Why? We want to make sure that we have an idea of how long we're going to live. Now, you're not going to be able to be perfect about that. Got more to say about that. So you're going to estimate the number of days, the rapidity. With, boy, they're just days are just flying by to estimate the liability that I, maybe I'm not going to live as long as I would like to, to estimate the certainty that our days may soon come to an end. I may not be, I, I don't feel like I'm going to live another week longer. Okay? To estimate the days that as bearing on our future state of being. What, what I'm doing right now is going to have something to do with what I'm going to be out there in the future. You see, our rewards at the Bema Seat, our reward or rewards, they don't honor us. They honor God because it was through his grace, his logistical grace provision, that we were able to accomplish what we did and receive these rewards. So when you're talking about numbering your days, what are you doing? You're estimating our, your days as bearing our, on our, our future state of being. And the issue is I might want to live longer so that I can honor God more by the reward that he's going to give me because he provided everything I need to be able to produce the reward. Hmm. He goes on to say in this verse that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Look at the verse. So teach us the number of our days. Why? In order that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. What does that mean? That we may present a heart of wisdom. Moses' prayer, again, is a contemporary, uh, we can make a contemporary application out of this. That we may present to you, God, a heart of wisdom, Moses' contemporary prayer, that God would enable us to, to form a true estimate of life. What is life really all about? Can you, do you have any idea what most people out here think life is all about? Oh, it's all about me. Got a whole bunch of people trying to control us. They're control freaks. Got to wear a mask. Got to do this. Got to do that. Can't do this. Can't do that. Can't go to church. Can't. Oh, you can't sing out loud. You can't sing. You got to do this. Got to do that. See, people trying to control. Hold it just a moment. God wants us to do these things in order that we may present that that we may present to God. A heart of wisdom. We want a true estimate of life. What is life really, really all about? He wants us, he wants us to, to present to God a heart of wisdom in order that we will be truly wise. God wants us to be wise. 
A heart of wisdom is certainly not a heart of foolishness. If we're living a foolish life, that's not a heart of wisdom. God wants us to be truly wise. Why? In order that we may be able to act as if we see life all the way to the end. See, we don't know how we don't know how long we're going to live. But as you're looking down the road and you are a wise individual, you're going to be able to look down the road there and have a true estimate of what life is. You're going to be truly wise. You're going to you're going to be able to see life all the way to its end. Now, notice this. I say, yes, he does. What does what does he do? God sees the end. God sees the end of life. He sees the time, the manner, and the circumstance in which each of us, are, of our lives, each of our lives is going to come to an end. God sees all that. He knows the time. He knows the manner. He, said, he knows the circumstances in which each of us, our lives will come to an end. Hmm. Although God has wisely hidden that information. See, <laughs> All of this he wants us to know. He wants us to know. But the truth of the matter is he's wisely hidden all this information for us. From us. And although he's done that, he can enable us to do something. Although God has wisely hidden this information from us, he enables us to do what? To act as if we see the end of our days for ourselves. To have the same goals for our life as he, God, has for us. And this is why when I look at this thing and I understand what the Christian way of life is all about, I realize that many people are dissatisfied with all that's going on. They pull their hair out. They're, they're, they're belly aching, complaining about life. This is not what life is all about. And when I look at this thing and say, although God has wisely hidden this information from us, he, can ena he enables us to act as if we see the end of our days for ourselves. And I do, and this is why I jokingly say, this is my sixth year of my second 80. I've told you I'm not done. I don't want to be done. There's too much to do. But it'll be done on God's time schedule. God may take me tonight. He may take me tomorrow. I don't know. But he wants us to have the same goals for our life that he has for us. God, what do you want me to do? He said, I, here's what I want. And he said, well, that's okay with me, Father. That's what I want for myself, see? So this prayer in our passage is that God will enable us to act as if we knew when, where, and how we would die. Why? So that our understanding would exert an important influence on us in our forming our plans, an important influence on our general manner of life. Hmm. Psalm 9014. We're about out of time. Psalm 9014. He said, Satisfy us in the morning with your graciousness that we may sing for joy and rejoice all our days. Satisfy us in the morning. What does that mean? Well, it is understood that this alludes to Israel's afflictions. See, Israel was an afflicted nation. They had enemies all around them trying to take over. And so he said, satisfy us in the morning with your graciousness. This is understood that this alludes to Israel's affliction. The Israelites knew they were being afflicted, and that's represented as night. So when you, 12 o'clock noon, there's Things going all around them that's bad. And says it's just like nighttime. There's no day. It's just, it's things aren't going right. So they see that as nighttime. But Moses' prayer is that that morning, the morning of mercy and joy might dawn upon Israel. It's a bad night, but the morning will be great. All that is saying is you're afflicted, Israel, but I have the answer for you. Everything is going to be okay. So we have a question. Does that, does that not have a contemporary application for Christians who are living an experientially spiritual life, doing the right thing in the right way, 
The answer is yes. What does that mean? You may have pain, you may be afflicted, you may have per you may be persecuted, but the truth of the matter is God has this thing in his own hand. And when you realize that, he goes on to say that we may sing for joy and rejoice all our days. The prayer is that Israel's memory of God's gracious interposition on Israel's behalf will go with them all the way to their graves. Now, let me let me close with this. What does it mean when I say the prayer is that Israel's memory, your memory, my memory of God's gracious interposition, interposition for us on our behalf will go with us all the days of our life, go all the way to our grave. Lord, I remember what you did for me back there. I remember what you did over here. I saw the mess when I was in, but I, I trusted you and Lord, you pulled me right out of that. See, God interposes, he steps in between. So what we have here is a picture of Israel's enemies and Israel on the other side and God standing in the middle. Your enemies, God in the middle, and you on the other side. God interposes. He injects himself into the middle. And I heard Jim Jordan tonight on the on the news in, in, indicate something that I've been telling you for I don't know how long. And that is when you find yourself afflicted today and we want to carry on, listen, it's going to be up, not, not Washington, D.C. It will be up to our governor, our state legislators to interpose between our enemies out here and what they're trying to take away from us. To keep us being, from being able to, to evangelize the lost, teach the saved, send out missionaries, and be a friend of Israel. Heads bowed nice foot. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for this truth. Goodness gracious. One day at a time. One day at a time. These five principles. I pray, Father, that we will give attention to them. As David told Solomon, he said, look, keep my commandments. David wanted stability in Solomon's life. I want, I want stability in my own life, Father. I want to think right. I don't want to be a fool. I know it's found in your word. Metabolizing your word, applying it to the circumstances of life, trusting you in every circumstance. This is where the mental stability comes. This is where the joy is, even in the midst of suffering. May we take this information to heart, Father. May we, may, we, may we concentrate on it. May we guard it in Christ's name. Amen. God bless all of you folks. I, I praise the Lord for you being with me tonight. Now remember, this coming, this coming Sunday, we'll be at the American Pie Pizza. And listen, we're not starting at 9 now. So for those who are not going to be able to local, we'll be starting at 10 o'clock our time. Uh, and for our friends that are in the Philippines, that'll be midnight your time. So if you if you want to listen to the recording later, that's fine. I understand that. But God bless all of you, and I'll see you again this Sunday morning, 10 o'clock Central Standard Time. Good day.